crushed and conquered. David was so the women, they came together, they were singing to the Lord. Christianity is singing religion. And the Jewish people were singing people. Look at Jehoshaphat there. For the Lord is good, and he is a good for, uh, to everyone. And then, uh, grace be, uh, praise be unto the Lord. Praise be unto the Lord. Bless his holy name. They were singing, and while they were singing, the enemies were now being conquered. Now, they came to a perplexing time. The songs they had sung that brought joy, that brought happiness, the songs they had sung that brought, you know, lifting up for them, the enemies that carried them captive required of them a song. And they that wasted us required of us meal, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 they say, but how shall we sing the song, the Lord song in a strange land. They were now strangers. They were now strangers in the place where they were actually now. Nebuchadnezzar and the people that carried them captive, they wanted them to forget. Forget Jerusalem. Forget Judah. Forget all those songs who are singing to God. Your creator will teach you our own kind of song. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, that's what the Babylonians want to do. They want us to uh, forget God and forget Jerusalem, the capital city and the holy city of God. And they were now in the, in the land of uh, strangers. They were now saying, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget. Get a corny. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, if I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my tongue. If I do not remember you, I will not sing any song. Let my tongue cleave to the root uh, to the uh, root of my of my of my mouth, to the roof of my house. That is, they said, if we're not going to sing the song of Zion, no other singing. If we're not going to talk about Jerusalem, happy Jerusalem, holy Jerusalem, and the new Jerusalem above, if we cannot think of that, if we cannot uh, purposefully go in that direction, let us not even talk to anybody. If we're not, if we're not talk about Jehovah, if we cannot talk about his goodness, about his blessing, about his salvation, if we cannot talk about his power and his sovereignty, we're not going to even talk about anything anymore on earth. They said, if I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. That's what they should have done when they were back at home. When everything was all right, when they woke up in the morning and they said, praise the Lord, if the Lord had did this work, when God gave them food and clothing and shelter and everything, and when he put protected them everywhere. That's what they should have done. They should have understood that the city of the living God should be above their chiefest joy. They should also have understood that they remember Jerusalem, remember God, remember everything about God every time. But now perplexity came unto them. I pray perplexity will not come to you. That what was should have done, what God is favorable, what the opportunities are there, and why the good things are there for us, what we should have done, we do. Rather than being careless, and then we allow captivity to come, and then we are perplexed, and we're in a strange land, in a place where we cannot sing the song of Zion. Look at Micah, Micah chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 4. In Micah chapter 7, verse 4, the best of them is as a briar, and most upright is sharper than a sun edge. The day of thy watchmen and thy visitation comes now shall be their perplexity. Now shall be their perplexity when they should have been sought, they were hard, harsh, and hardened. And when they should have been helpful, they were hurtful. When they should have been hopeful, they were hopeless. And when they should have joyfully, joyfully followed the Lord and joyfully obeyed the word of the Lord, they were like 
briars and thorns in the sight of the Lord. And because of that, now shall be their perplexity. I for those of us who are living on earth today. Any perplexity? Look at Luke chapter 21. We're reading from verse 25. Luke chapter 21. And we're reading from verse 25. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself was the one that said this. And he said, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. Distress of nations with perplexity. You might have heard, if you are scientific mind oriented, about heart warming. You might have heard about the pollution of the air. You might have heard about how this world is not taking care of us as it should take care of us. You might have heard that the air we breathe today because of uh, the industrial age, the air we breathe today is not as pure as the air the many, pe many people hundreds of years ago that were breathing. You might have heard that even the fruit of the ground growing up, the, 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 the earth is depleted. And because of that, what we are getting, the scientists are concerned. Even those who are not Christian, by just studying their sin, they don't know how much time we still have on this earth. Meanwhile, the population of the world is increasing and the world, the earth is not able to support everybody. The knowledgeable people, they're perplexed already. What do we do? And the diseases are multiplying. You will think that, you know, the more we are civilized and the farther we go, you'll think the healthier we should become. Look at the knowledge we have. You can check up anything now. You just Google that and search that. You'll get the information and yet with all that we're sicker today in the world than they were at that time we are perplexed and it says the things that will be happening to the sun things that will be happening to the moon and the distress of nations nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom and then it says with perplexity look at verse 26 in verse 26 it says men's heart failing them have you heard people have just heart attack and they are gone they appeared healthy yesterday they appeared healthy last week and they were you know maybe doing something they just slump and they collapse they are gone and it's happening at a greater rate than it used to happen the people that have high blood pressure high blood pressure has become something that is uh, very very high now all over the world, you think it's only those of us over here in Africa because we don't take care of this, we don't take care of this, that's how we have that. But now, over the America, Europe, everywhere, is one of the terrible killers of people, whether in the West or in the South and in the North, anywhere. That's where we are today because men's hearts are failing them for fear and for looking after those things which have come in on the earth and the powers of the sky, of the heavens, of the galaxies, of the planets shall be shaken. Let's look at number three. Number three, we're looking at uh, the painful consequence of an unfixed past. Unfixed past. Actually, for the people of Judah, the Lord told them, he said, you'll plow the land for six years. The seventh year, the land will rest. And, um, you know, they said, who can follow that kind of principle? But their forefathers followed that. Every seventh day, they will gather the manna for six days. If they gathered on the seventh day, if they tr tried to gather, they will not get. Because God wanted for them that seventh day to be free. And then if they left it over on the sixth day to the seventh day, it will breed worms. And he wanted that also for the land, that the land will rest one year after six years of cultivation. They did not. And so God was looking at them. It was patient with them. For 470 years, they continued like that. And God said, enough. You see, a sinner can go on sinning and sinning 
one day God will say, that's enough. A sinner can keep on rebelling, revolting against the Lord. One day God says, that is enough. At the end of 490 years, the Lord said, you should have kept one year out of seven, one year out of seven. And so he divided 490 by seven. And he got 70 and said, I'll send you to captivity. And then the land will rest for the 70 years. That's what happened to them. Is the painful con consequence of an unfixed past. The past they didn't fix up properly. Jeremiah chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 12. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this. And be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, says the Lord. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and healed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They were trying to replace the word of God, the law of God, with their own ideas ideas and opinions and the Lord said they're broken cisterns, they're crash they're human they, they will not last, they will not hold any water, I gave you something perfect, I gave you my word, I gave you my will you're forsaking that and you're following after broken cisterns look at verse 14 in verse 14 is Israel a servant, I call you son I told Pharaoh, let my son go. But now, is Israel a servant? Is he a homeborn slave? Why? Is he spoiled? Look at verse 17. In verse 17, as thou not procured this unto thyself, it's not my fault. I love you. It's not my fault. I wanted you to be my favorite son, my favorite nation, all through until the end of the world. But you have procured this unto thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, thine own wickedness shall correct thee. I try to correct you by word of mouth, but you are not lazy, all right? Your action, your behavior, the consequence of your character and your wickedness shall correct thee and thy backslidings, in the plural, your backslidings shall reprove thee, know therefore, and see that it is an evil sin and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee, says the Lord God of hosts. It tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 15, many things that are piled up in the past we've done that and god appears quiet we do another thing god appears silent and then we go ahead and we're testing god we're testing the genuineness of the law of god we're testing the might of god we're testing the sincerity of god we'll say i've done that now i've conquered him i've conquered god because as I did that, and other people did that, and other people did that, and will transfer it one to the other. If God is going to judge anyone, he's going to judge everybody. And now we're paralyzing. He cannot do what he said he will do. They didn't know that God is long-suffering, not willing that anyone should perish. But the day of reckoning will come. Look at this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 15. That which has been is now and that which is to be has already been and God requires that which is past and God requires that which is past God was saying Israel what did I tell you rest one day out of seven Judah, what did I tell you? Rest one year out of seven. By the way, do you know that is why 
some workers are allowed, especially lecturers at universities, is sabbatical. It's the Bible principle. He has been teaching and lecturing and researching, doing everything for six years. They say, now you can go. They still employ there. There's still lecturers there. There's still, you know, employees there. But go for one year, then come back again. Be refreshed. Isn't that what you should do? Isn't that why we have the Lord's Day? We walk for six days, and in the seventh day, we worship the Lord. We read the Bible. We revive ourselves. We pray, and we kind of rejuvenate so that before Monday, we're fresh again. We were tired and weak at the end of the week, but now we're calm. And this day is not a day to keep on running. Some people just keep on running and running and running. It will tell. It will tell. Because God will say, no rest at all. They will not even sleep. The time they ought to sleep, God requires that which is past. It is good we are born again. It's good we are children of God. But you know, we've been, if you have been smoking and drinking for years, and the tissues, they are worn down. The cells, they are broken down. And the, uh, everything you have, even DNA is affected. And all the body is affected. And you keep on and keep on. God will forgive. God will forgive. They keep on drinking. God will forgive. Yes, God will forgive. But what of the damage you've done to your body, to your system, to your brain, to your nerves, to your cells, and to everything that you have within you. All those many years, the earlier you repent, the better. It is for your good, because God requires that which is past. There are, you know, young people, they, go, they should go to school, and they, they go to school, of course, and then at school, they don't read, they are just following gangs and following this and that, and they say, I know myself, I have the brain. When the exam is coming, I just read and cram and make it. And now they've wasted almost six years in the secondary school, and now the exam is coming, and they want to burn the midnight oil, God requires that which is past. All throughout the year, we live a life, a life of carelessness. And then we say at the end of the year, December 31st, we're going to make resolution. And resolution, it doesn't work that way. Because you see, all those things we have done during the year, they become habitual. And we cannot just change the habit like that. God requires that which is past. We have to go back to God and we have to say, Lord, we understand what we've done. The past has been terrible. We've weakened ourselves. We've destroyed ourselves because we we'll take that past to the Lord and we we'll say, Lord, forgive. And thank God, a loving God, he will forgive everyone. And then we say, God, renew my youth and renew my life. Thank God he has the power. If you go to God in good time, it will, it will renew you in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 23. Romans chapter 3, we're looking at verse 23. For all have sinned, have sinned, that the past, past, the past of many people, bad terrible. All have seen that come short of the glory of God. Look at verse 25. In verse 25 it says whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. That's what Christ came to deal with so that he can revive us again, he can renew us again. All those past things, he wants to forgive. Why don't you bring them to the Lord? All the past things that destroyed us, he wants to remove them and give you a new life. Why don't you come to him? Because he removes, he has remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. I pray that a new life will come to you. A new strength, a new energy will come to you. A new focus, a new vision will come to you in Jesus' name. And this year will not be like last year. I'm saying that today will not be like three, four days ago. Something new will happen to you. 
new life will come to you. A new energy and strength will come to you in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number two now. Point number two, the character of the chosen amidst pollution. We're dividing this to three parts. Number one, deportation by the Chaldeans to the land of corruption. Number two, desperation of corruptors to lead into corruption. Number three, Daniel and his companions, learners who are not corruptible. We're coming to number one. Number one is deportation by the Chaldeans to the land of corruption. Daniel chapter one, we're looking at verse three. Daniel chapter 1, we're looking at uh, verse 3, it says that the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, children in whom was no blemish in whom children, in whom was no blemish, the Lord God of heaven had preserved some people that they would be without blemish so that they can serve him. But um, this man, the chief, the king of uh, Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, wanted those people prepared by God and prepared for God. He wanted them to serve him rather than serving God. Children in whom uh, was no blemish but well -fed and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge, clever, sharp, knowledgeable, and in understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the language, the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. You know what they were doing? They wanted to brainwash them. They wanted to clear away from their mind everything they had known about the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. They wanted to push all that aside. They even gave them their own Babylonian names so that they will not remember their names related to the Almighty God. They didn't want that to remain with them. They wanted to clear off everything they knew before, and they wanted them to follow the corruption of uh, this uh, of Nebuchadnezzar and of Babylon. But the question is, why did that happen? How did that happen? In our lives, when we're saying that children somewhere, we should think what we want our children to go and learn. And what world view we want our children to go and get, just say education, education, education. That's what they presented to them. But you see, education alone is not enough for life. We need our lives. It's not just uh, you know bread and butter. Our life, social life, our life, marital life, our life, family life, our life, professional life, our life, uh, you know, Christian life, spiritual life. We must take everything into consideration. But now. What were they wanting to do? How did this happen? The deportation by the Chaldeans to the land of corruption. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 39. We're reading from verse 1. Isaiah 39 verse 1. At that time, Merodach Baladan. What a name. The son of Baladan. King of Babylon at that time. Said letters and presents to Hezekiah. For he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, And Ezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things. And then he goes on to say the silver and the gold and the, and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor. And all that was found in his treasures, there was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, his kingdom, that Ezekiah showed them not. That's the origin of the problem of Judah. Ezekiah was their king. He was sick. 
to the point of death. Isaiah came to him and said, set your house in order. You will die. You will not live. He turned to the wall and he prayed and he said, oh God, remember how perfectly I've served you and I don't want to die now. God said, Isaiah, go back to him and tell him I will heal him. I give him 50 years extra. And this is after he got well. The king of Babylon at that time came to him and uh, sent letters, uh, you know, sent emissaries and letters. And he was so happy that the unbelievers, the sinners, they appreciated his getting well. And he said, don't go yet. I will show you all that I possess. All the things in himself, from room to room, apartment to apartment, chamber to chamber. He went everywhere and showed them everything. And they were nodding their heads. This is great. You are a great king. I don't go yet. All the things of the kingdom, the authority he had, the substance he had, everything he had, he showed them everything. Look at verse 3 now. In verse 3 it says, Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Ezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Ezekiah said, they are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, then said he, What have they seen in thine house? And Ezekiel answered, All that is in my house have they seen. He, there is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Then Isaiah said to Ezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Verse 6, verse 6, Behold, the days come, that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store, until this day shall they carry, shall be carried to Babylon, nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Verse 7, verse 7 says, and of thy sons, the descendants, that's how uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego got involved, and thy sons that shall issue. From thee, even the children he had not born, he had not given back to, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, what should Ezekiah do hearing that? Because when Asa told him, you will die. Set your house in order. He cried. He waved. I've lived a perfect life. I will not die now. And God answered his prayer. What did he say when God told him everything you showed them, all that your fathers have gathered, everything they will take away? Look at verse in verse eight now. It says in verse eight, then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good in the word of the Lord. That's all right. God has said, they'll take everything. That's okay. All your children, the descendants, they'll take them. That's okay. Look at that. What kind of prayer do we pray? When it comes to healing, how do we pray? How do we claim the promises of God? When God now says, everything that your forefathers have gathered, every good thing you have had, every opportunities you have had, every, you are going to lose everything. Okay, okay, okay. That's God. Whatever he wants to do, I'm all right, you are not all right. Look at the consequence. That's what it says now. It says, for there shall, it says, that's okay. Because he said, moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. My friend, that is selfish. Look at Isaiah chapter 52. And we're reading from the first part of verse 3. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 3. For thus says the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught. It was their fault. You have sold yourself for naught. Why don't you look at your life this new year? What have I lost? What made me to lose those things? How did I sell myself? How did I sell my opportunities? How did I sell my future? How did I sell my destiny? 
in a way I shouldn't have done that. That's what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying, check up. Because in the case of Judah, the deportation to the land of corruption is that they sold themselves for nothing. Let's look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at desperation of corruptors to lead into corruption. The Babylonians were desperate. All they wanted to do was to corrupt all these uh, people of Judah. Daniel chapter 1, we're reading from verse 3. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his, uh, of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, you see children in whom uh, there was no blemish uh, and uh, and but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability. They have the stature, they have the posture, they have the knowledge, they have the decorum, they have everything to stand in the presence of the king in the palace. And then it says, Whom so we might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the edge thereof they might stand before the king. Uh, that, that's scholarship. Scholarship. They give them scholarship all those um, Young men, young women, they brought from, uh, from Judah onto Babylon. Their food paid for, accommodation paid for, and textbooks paid for. Everything they needed paid for. That was scholarship. But watch. The scholarship is to turn their mind away from God. The scholarship is to make them have the culture and the condition and the situation and the learning and the mindset of the Babylonians, they were so desperate in wanting to corrupt them, and they had the money, and they had the facilities. So they used all the money and the facilities to corrupt them. Amos chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. In Amos chapter 2, verse 11, I raised up your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, says the Lord, the Lord raised up their sons. He wanted them to be prophets. He wanted them to be teachers of the word. He wanted them to be Nazarites, totally committed, consecrated unto the Lord. And God said, that's how I raised up your sons and your children. Is that not so, O Israel? What did they do? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, but ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink. Even you yourselves, I wanted your children to be clean, to be pure, and then to be profitable to me and the kingdom of God. But you gave those your own children that I'm raising up as prophets and as Nazarites. You gave them wine to drink, and you commanded the prophets, saying, prophesy not. And I wanted them to prophesy. I wanted them to be my channel that will reveal my revelation. But you said, no, no. Our children will not be prophets, will not be preachers, will not be pastors. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> In verse 13, it says, behold, I am pressed under you. God said, I'm disappointed. I'm pressed. I'm displeased. Because I want your children to be good, righteous, holy, godly, and then to serve me. But you corrupted even your own children. He said, I am pressed under you as a cat is pressed that is full of sheep. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 4, a sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children 
that are corrupt us in their own land, in Judah. They corrupted their own people with ideas, ideologies, and philosophies, and psychology, and idolatry, and tradition, every evil thing. And they brought, they borrowed all the ideologies of the, of the unbelievers, and of the world, and of the Gentiles into their land. And they became corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. That's the reason why. Okay, you already you've gone into corruption. I wasn't expecting this. I'll take you to where you see you're looking for corruption. You'll get it there. And it took it took them to Babylon. And those Babylonians, they were really at it to bring corruption to them, to corrupt and to destroy all their children. Hosea chapter 9, we're looking at verse 9. Hosea chapter 9, <coughs> we're looking at verse 9. In verse 9, it says, they have deeply corrupted themselves. The children of Israel, the people of Judah, they have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Therefore, he will remember their iniquity. He will besiege their sin. That is the reason why God allowed them to be taken to Babylon so that they'll be totally, cor they'll be totally corrupted. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, my God will cast them away because they did not hack in unto him. They did not hack in unto him. Believers, children of God that should listen to God and when God had made all the sacrifices necessary to make them clean, make them acceptable, make them pure and prepare them for glory. But instead of that, God said, my God will cast them away. Why? Because they did not hack in unto him, and they shall be wondrous among the nations. So we're coming to number three here. Number three, Daniel and his companions, learners who are not corruptible. Yet, they wanted to suck in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the system of Babylon corrupt them, make them unfit to live with God on earth, unfit to go to God in heaven. But these people, Daniel and his companions, were not corruptible. We're looking at Daniel chapter 1, reading from verse 6. In verse 6, they say, now, among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, unto whom whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, Belshazzar and to Ananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of, of Meshach, and of uh, Azariah of Abednego. Those were the companions, but they were companions in purity, companions in prayer companions in purposefulness, companions in perseverance, companions of remaining with the Lord and saying this is where we stand. And look at Daniel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 17. Daniel chapter 2 verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah his companions, his companions, they are companions together, companions in following the Lord, companions in doing the will of the Lord. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says that they would desire mercies of the Lord of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows, his friends, his companions should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Let's look at chapter 3. We're looking at verse 15. Daniel chapter 3, verse 15. It says, this is Nebuchadnezzar now calling them and saying, I set up my idol. And if you don't worship him, this is what worship it. This is what I will do. But remember, Daniel and his companions had the same conviction. 
and the same courage and the same mindset. They were going to worship God. They were not going to worship any idol. And it says in Daniel chapter 3, about 15 now, if you be ready at what time you hear the sound of the cornet and, and, uh, and also of the flute and harp and sackbut and Sabri and Dulcima and all kinds of music, idolatrous music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fairy furnace. And who is that God that shall? deliver you out of my hands. Look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful, we are not anxious, and we are not fearful, we are not timid to answer thee in this matter. Look at verse 17. If it be so, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the bony, furry furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Then in verse 18, but if not, even if he will not deliver us, if he prefers that we burn in that furnace and then go from the furnace and go to paradise and go to heaven. That's all right. They said, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Those are good companions. What kind of companion do you have? What kind of friends do you have? What kind of associates do you have? Who are you intimate with? Who do you talk to almost every day, almost every week? Are they, are they people that have the same conviction as you have? The same courage as you have? The same consecration as you have? Do you have companions that will stand for, the, for God through thick or thin, whatever? Or are they compromisers because birds of the same feather they flock together in first corinthians chapter 15 reading from verse 33 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 be not deceived evil communications corrupt good manners if your companions are evil if your companions are wayward if your companions are defiled and defiling people if your companions are disobedient and rebellious people if your companions are deceptive people and being deceived as well, you will take on their character because it says, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Verse 34 it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three is the courage of conviction with purposeful purity. The courage of conviction with purposeful purity. Look at chapter 1 of Daniel. We're looking at verse 8. Daniel chapter 1. And we're looking at uh, verse 8. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. Purposed in his heart. That's the seed of decision. That's the center of decision. It's not the mind. It's not the head. It's not the eyes. I read, I read, I read. That doesn't make a person a firm, courageous man, woman of conviction. It's when that knowledge you read about, that thing you hear about, goes from your mind, from your head, and goes to your heart. And your heart takes a decision at the very center of your being. And, it's, and you say, this is who I am, a child of God. This is how I will live. You decide that before the day of temptation. You decide that before the day of corruption. You decide that before you get to that office, before you get to that market. If you don't take the decision on your knees at home, if you don't have the conviction before the Lord at home, and then you say to it with the Lord, this is the way I'm going to live. Whatever I gain, whatever I lose, 
this will be my life. And then you have the grace of God in your life to be saved, the grace of God that sanctifies. You settle that, now you can go out. Whatever happens already, the decision has been made already. The conviction is obtained already. The courage is inside there. And when the challenge now comes, we'll be able to build on that conviction, build on that courage. He said, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Why? The, the meat and the wine had been sacrificed to their idols. That's their, that's their uh, position and their practice in the land of corruption in Babylon. It, and so he purposed that he's not going to take that. And he says, therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he would not defile himself. He requested. You know, some people say, okay, I don't want to do that. I will put the fleece down. If that person does not call me, then I know I will not do it. If that person did not text me, then I know I will not do it. If you don't send a chat, then I will not. No! You don't want to make up your mind. Whatever he sends, whatever he does, whatever he asks, you say, I have this conviction. You don't put any fleece down. Salvation doesn't work by fleece. Sanctification doesn't work by fleas. You make up your mind that you will not defile yourself. We're looking at three things here. Number one, number one, the purposeful heart cleansed from all defilement. Number two, the purified heart, courageous, against acknowledged defilement. What I mean by acknowledged defilement is uh, already Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the wine acknowledge the meat, acknowledge the idol. And so, those people who are taking us, it's an acknowledged thing. And you call it defilement, okay? Call it defilement is acknowledged defilement. Even then, anybody can approve of it. Anybody can recommend it. Anybody can do it. Anybody can acknowledge it, to affirm it, to confirm it. He, Daniel, still made up his mind. He was not going to have anything to do with acknowledged defilement. Number three, the persevering heart consecrated without any defilement. Look at number one. Number one is the purposeful heart cleansed from all defilement. I've read it already, but look at, um, look at Psalm 119. We're reading from verse 1. In Psalm 119, verse 1, blessed are they at your defiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 2 says, in verse 2, blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. In verse 3, it tells us in verse 3, they also do no iniquity. Iniquity coming from the palace, they do no iniquity. Iniquity coming from the king, give this to them, tell them, I, the king, the emperor, I send this to them. Iniquity coming from the chief and from the emperor, from the king of Babylon, they do you know iniquity? Iniquity coming from a friend. Iniquity, iniquity coming from a favorite. Iniquity coming from somebody, a bosom friend. No, I cannot do that. This will separate us because I made up my mind and I have a purposeful heart cleansed already from all defilement and they do know iniquity. They walk in his ways. Look at verse 9. Where we shall a young man cleanses his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. How do we cleanse our ways? We hear the word of God. We take that word to the Lord and we allow the blood of Jesus to cleanse us and purge and purify us. And then from there on we have a purposeful heart that we're not going to defile ourselves. Mark chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 20. Mark chapter 7. And we're looking at verse 20. It says in verse 20, and he said, That which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. Wine, yes, defiles the man. 
the meat of Babylon defiles the man. I do not trust uh, something is sacrificed to idol. And for us to take that, that defiles the man. But more than that, in verse 21, in verse 21, it says, For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, verse 22, and thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lying, deception, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Verse 23, it says, all these evil things come from within and they defile the man. And so our decision, our dedication, our devotion, our consecration is that any of these things will not have any part in our lives because we're not going to defile ourselves. Look at number two here. Number two, the purified heart, courageous against acknowledged defilement. We're looking at Acts chapter 15, verse 9, and put no difference between us and them, us Jews and them Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. We are saved and we are pardoned by faith. We're sanctified, we're purified by faith. After we have been saved, we go back to the Lord. He who had done the first work of grace, he will do the second work of grace as well. He'll purify, he'll sanctify, purifying their hearts by faith. And what it does is there's something in the heart natural. There's something in the heart, Adamic. There's something in the heart, in the heart, depraved. Even though our external sins had been forgiven, there is that thing in the heart that will lean towards the Adamic nature. There's something in the heart that will lean towards the depraved nature. There's something in the heart that will lean towards all those internal secret things and they will contradict the grace of God and the nature of God in our lives. But when we go back to God after we're saved, when we go back to God after as we're sanctified and we say, God, sanctify, purify, cleanse our hearts, then that is done and then he cleanses us and purifies us. I pray he'll do it for every one of us. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36 and I'm reading from verse 25, Ezekiel chapter 36, reading from verse 25, but then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. This is not what Ezekiel will do. This is what God will do. And ye shall be clean, and from all your idols, and from all your idols, and filthiness, will I cleanse you. That's salvation. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. A new heart also also that means i have done the first one i have cleansed you from all your idols from all your filthiness and all your defilement also after that salvation it says in your heart also will i give you and a new spirit will i put within you and i will take away the stony heart the one that said why should i be resisting every day you know fighting against sin and fighting against uh, all these is uh, corruption every day. I think I'm tired. Let what, ha let what will happen happen. He says, no, I give you a new heart. That's Tony heart. I'm tired. That's Tony heart. I cannot, you know, do that again. I'm going to have my own way. He says, I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. That's sanctification. Verse 25, that's salvation. Verse 26, that's sanctification. Look at verse 27 now. In verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. Holy Ghost baptism. He wants us to have salvation. He wants us to have uh, uh, sanctification. He wants us to have the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. I pray the grace of God will increase in your life. Amen. Multiply in your life. Amen. This new year, a new life. A new direction. A new strength, 
a new power in Jesus name look at number three there number three in the persevering heart consecrated without any defilement Daniel Shadrach Meshach and Abednego they were not only there for one week for one month they were there in that college in that school in that training that Nebuchadnezzar put them three years and what they said at the beginning we will not defile ourselves no defilement will touch our knees no defilement will come to our lives all through the three years they were like that because they had a persevering heart and were told that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they came to Babylon, they were brought to Babylon around the age of 18. Some people say 20. And they were there all the time of the captivity, 70 years. When you had 70 to 18 or 20, and by the time the captivity was ending, um, Daniel was about 88 to 90 years. And he still lived beyond the Babylonian captivity. When the Middle Persian came in, the government came in, he was still there. Cyrus came in, he was still there there he was going to nearly a hundred years of age he was still there but he had a persevering heart he will not corrupt himself he will not compromise he was not tired of following after the lord all the days of his life that same strength the lord will give unto you we're looking at jeremiah chapter 32 and we're reading from verse 30 jeremiah chapter 32 verse 38 and they shall be my people and i will be their god in verse 39 it says and i will give them one heart daniel shadrach meshach abednego the same heart the same salvation, the same sanctification, and the same commitment, conviction, consecration unto the Lord, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever, persevering, permanent, perpetual, that they will fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. Look at verse 40. In verse 40 it says, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Persevering heart, they shall not depart from me. And then he says in verse 41, in verse 41, yea, yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. What he did for them, he'll do it for you in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 139. We're looking at verse 23. Psalm 139. We're looking at a verse. We're looking at verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. As we come to the end of the study tonight, everyone, you have come because you love God, because you want to serve God. You have come because you want to walk in the way of the Lord. Why don't you ask the Lord, Oh Lord, am I like Daniel? Am I like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do I have this uh, purposeful heart? Do I have this purified heart? Do I have this persevering heart? Search me, O God, and know my heart try me and know my thoughts look at verse 24 it says in verse 24 and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting what you did for them that it could stand like that without any corruption without any defilement all through those years do for us that in this new year we'll be living a bright life brighter life better life higher life holy life that we ever lived in Jesus name search me O Lord try me know my heart and lead me in the way everlasting the Lord will do it for you let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer rise up and open your mouth and say Lord here am I this is what I desire the life I ought to live now this is what I desire the Lord will do it. Pray, believe God, 
greater year you have this year. Go to the Lord in prayers. The call. We're in a new year now. Have you answered the call? God, choosing and faithful. Make up your mind. Lord, I will be among the choosing. I will be faithful unto you. In all things to the end. Want you to call upon the name of the Lord. That whatever challenge you face this year, you will make up your mind to remain pure, to remain undefiled. But you need to watch your own company. Who are your friends? God, upon the name of the Lord, no matter the situation you find yourself in Babylon, in that place of work, that you remain uncorruptible, whether in captivity or in the free world, you remain pure. Like Daniel, the people try to condition them, but they remain committed to the Lord wherever we are, anywhere in the world, make up your mind.